Michael J. So, first look at some of the new events with Theros Beyond Death. Uh, what do you think about hitting standard this week? Yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Theros Beyond Death, uh, a lot to impact standard with, you know. Um, where to start, though? I mean, obviously, the the Mitgo uh, events from uh, this past weekend, there was a standard challenge, or I guess the beginning of the week, there was a standard challenge earlier this week and, and some league results that are up. Yeah, both. Um, what are you more interested in? I mean, what colors are you interested in? Because there's big splashes from, like, everybody. Yeah, I mean, there's all like all over. I mean, first of all, uh, without question, I'm I'm really into looking. Like, I kind of want to get some information about Black Devotion, and in this case, like, there's a great example of Black Devotion in uh, second the the runner up at the uh, Standard Challenge, Bertram playing a mono black deck with uh, uh, you know four Gray Merchant of Asphodel as the big thing, but. Also, two Timoret chosen from death and three drag to the underworld. Yeah. So those are all cards that have the, the text, um, you know, devotion to black on them. But it, I think like when it comes to impact from Theros beyond death, as important as Grey Merchant of Asphodel is at like finishing the game, it's got to go to Nightmare Shepherd, right? So Nightmare Shepherd's really exciting. Two black black for a 4-4 four, four flying. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, you may exile it. If you do create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a 1-1 one, one, and it's a nightmare in addition to its other types. So obviously uh, everybody knows you're a big fan of 4-4 four, four flyers for 4. But I mean, who uh, isn't, the, right? Who doesn't like that kind of a card? The Mondo combo here, the big Wombo combo, if you drop Grey Merchant when you've got the Nightmare Shepherd in a Ray, a, a Yara. You can sacrifice the Gray Merchant to replay it again. Now, it doesn't have the devotion from the token copy or whatever, but uh, the uh, amount that you can just finish people out of nowhere is pretty exciting. Oh, it hits like a um, truck. So I think that Ayara is, I mean, Ayara was like the centerpiece of a lot of mono black decks even before. Devotion to Black became a thing again, even before Theros Beyond Death brought us some of these cards. But I think that maybe, I don't even know if it's better, I don't know what the right word to use is, but a different Theros Beyond Death card. Woe Strider? Woe Strider is really exciting to me because, I, and I think that this card is underplayed right now. It's it's typically seen as a two of right now. Bertram's got it as a two of here, along with three copies of Ayara. But Woe Strider lets you sacrifice multiple things if you want, right? So Ayara, powerful as she is, she's she she has to go sideways. She has to tap to sacrifice another creature. Woe Strider can just has sacrifice another creature colon scry one. So if you've got like multiple things that you want to get um you know extra triggers from, whether it's Grey Merchant uh, or anything else. Like, there's just tons of stuff that that could potentially generate triggers uh, in this. I was going to say color combination, but it's just you know color, like Yerox Fen Lurker, which you can do at instant speed. I mean, I think Woe Strider is where it's at. Woe Strider looks incredible to me. Uh, a three two that makes a zero one uh, is already like not the worst. And no. then when you when you have sacrificed another creature to scry one, that card alone I think would already see play. The fact that you can escape it for three BB and exile four cards, and when you do, it gets two extra plus one plus one counters. That seems incredible to me. It's so powerful. Like I think like this card is just like a one a one card combo grinding machine. It What's already people... a combo? Yeah, it's just. It combos with other cards in your deck, right? Uh, in order to just generate um, just kind of grinding card advantage against people who have removal. So I think that's really good. I, I, I'm very excited both using Ayara for Subloc Wayne and Woe Strider in combination with Yerox Fenlurker if you have Nightmare Shepherd in play. Because Yerox Fenlurker, when Yerox Fenlurker enters the battlefield, each opponent exiles a card from their hand. If you've got somebody with no cards in hand, you can lock them down in their up, you know, their draw step, right? So they draw their card, and then you like sacrifice Yarox Fenlurker to, you know, get the trigger with with Nightmare Shepherd, and then they have to 
effectively discard during their draw step. And the thing that's super gross about this is Yorick Svenlurker is already a 1-1. One, one. So the 1-1 one, one that you get isn't even really a downgrade, right? It's just the same. Uh, sure. I mean, it doesn't have the the devotion that it's contributing, but for the most part... Um... What do you think of the use of four Dread Presence alongside these four Nightmare Shepherds? That's pretty serious, right? Uh, I think Dread Presence is not going to last in this. You know, there were a lot of Mono Black Devotion decks that placed highly in between these two events over the course of, uh, you know, the week so far. This card's a little expensive. You know, it costs four to get down. And I think, like, if you're... I think your four you really want is... Uh, is the Nightmare Shepherd, and you know, Dread Presence is a, an intense black card, right? It it has things that have to do with swamp, right? It has whenever a swamp enters the battlefield under your control, you get these triggers, but like, it doesn't actually it doesn't actually like give you a lot of black pips. It doesn't. It's a yeah, but who cares? No, yeah, no, it's not. It's totally because draining your opponent is synergistic with draining your opponent. That's true. I Plus, the extra cards are so valuable. If you just and the fact that this can hit any target, I mean, when you play this as a five drop, that's where the action is, right? Yeah. The thing that's that's cool to me is these mono black decks that have got one drop beaters like gutter bones in them are all playing like 25, 26 lands. Um, the expensive well, gutter bones are... isn't really even. A, I mean, he does beat down, but he's a combo with the Yara, yeah, sure. right? Like, isn't gutter bones just awesome with the Yara? Sure. So you I mean, can like, just do it. You just machine gun. Yeah, if you never if you never want to attack with it, it's uh, it's fine. Well, no, but also when you have gutter bones and uh, Woshtrider, or not Woshtrider, sorry. Uh, if you have yeah Woshtrider, if you have Woshtrider and gutter bones, you can just start getting them. In so far as like you can scry one a couple times, you know. Yeah, I mean that's that that is a form of getting them. Um, the thing that's really exciting to me and. Bertram didn't go real hard into this. There were people who played as many as three copies in the main deck. Is Bolus's Citadel? Bolus's Citadel has a whopping three black pips. That's the number one thing that I think is notable about this artifact. Yep. Yeah, but who cares? I mean, yeah, that's good. But isn't the big thing about Bolus's Citadel the fact that how often do you get to play a deck that has uh 13 life gain cards because that's the real thing right yeah. and they're, they're they gain a healthy chunk of life well the thing that's great about some of those cards is if you're going to play gray merchant of asphodel off the top of your library it's going to cost you five life but your worst case scenario because there's two black pips on gray merchant of asphodel and three black pips on bolus of citadel is you break even right in terms of how much life you're investing and typically you're just going to do better um, so I think that's pretty exciting. The one thing that I think Bertram missed that is definitely, I think, going to be a long-term um, addition to this archetype is the Witches, what's it called? Witches Hovel. The, it's, it's played in some of the other, other builds because if you've got um, Woe Strider, if you've got Ayara, you can sacrifice the Grey Merchant, put it in the graveyard, then use the land to put the Grey Merchant back on top of your library and then immediately cast it with Bolus of Citadel, which I think is very cool in in this uh, in this combination. It's hard to play very much of that. Are you talking like one? Yeah, like one. It's a, it, it's a, it's a meaningful functionality. This this deck sees potentially because it's got cards like Bolus of Citadel, right? It can see you can see that one. You know, IR is gonna you know help you dig. There's a couple things that help you dig. Okay. Yeah, because like um, the uh, there was somebody in the top eight, uh, no eleventh, eleventh place. JB Twist had a version that had one witch's cottage as the twenty sixth land. Yeah, um, and uh, Twist also only played two Ghost Riders, but they had two Cavalier of Night and uh, two Dreadhorde Invasion in lieu of the four Dread Presence. Yeah, I think that if I had to pick. The mono black devotion list that I just go and I, and I I'm forced to play this this build. Um, I think I'd go with JB Twist's version over some of the other ones. I think the Dread Horde Invasion with Iara is a sweet combo. Uh, I think that Cavalier of Night 
is a very similar kind of combo uh, when combined with cards like Woe Strider. Like, there's just little things, right? Like, you can sacrifice things, or specifically the Cavalier at instant speed, and then rebuy a three. That's something that is potentially pretty exciting to me. Um, you have cards like you know, Woe Strider itself. Like, you can play Cavalier of Night, and then Woe Strider's Goat can hook up the Cavalier of Night in terms of the the edict slash terror effect. Um, I'm a big fan. And then you're going even harder on the black pips. Like Cavalier of Night has got three black pips. This build has got, you know, three, co- I'm sorry, two copies of Bolas of Citadel in the main deck. So it's a little bit harder on the Bolas of Citadel part. Um, I, I just, I think this is like gonna be the breakout archetype of standard with uh, Theros Beyond Death. I don't know if it's gonna be the best deck, right? But in terms of decks that, kind of got an upgrade black black based sacrifice I, i'm not sure how to, i guess we call it mono black devotion i guess uh gray merchant of asphodel really steers us in that direction this, this yeah but i mean there's also timorant and drag to the underworld sure you know just jumping back to that second place deck i i would love to talk about timorant this card is such a kick in the teeth like you told me a few weeks ago to not play red aggro decks in standard. Oh my gosh, this thing is like infinite toughness. For it's a two casting cost card. Never get through it because the toughness is just going to be so big. And then it has this text, which is basically at poly poly effect to just ruin your day if you're trying to convert cards into damage. Exile up to two target cards from graveyards. You gain one life for each creature exiled this way. Plus it's. It's just good against escapes. It's just good against anybody who's, you know, specifically trying to target stuff in the graveyard to set up, you know, different kinds of triggers and abilities. Definitely. Uh, in particular, I mean, you're not always going to be able to get it, but I think the interaction against Cauldron Familiar is a meaningful one. Sure. Um, and actually, uh, over in the uh, the league, Rockfort uh, five owed with a mono black devotion deck that used four Cauldron Familiar and four Witches Oven. Four Cauldron Familiar and four Witches Oven for, a, you know, it's Cauldron Familiar instead of the uh, Gutter Bones and Witches Oven uh, as a uh, additional sort of engine plan. Yep. But then uh, four Agonizing Remorse for Disruption, which we didn't see in that many of the Mono Black decks, but it's kind of an interesting twist. And then... And this this part's a little bit kind of like I'm hoping you can fill me in. What am I missing? Isn't four tre- is four treacherous blessing? Like, that's pretty intense, right? Yeah. Well, I think it's like you were saying before. This archetype has a lot of life gain, right? So Ayara. Now we have Cauldron Familiar with Witch's Oven, right? So Witch's Oven, in fact, regardless of whether it's combining with Cauldron Familiar, is generate is a source of life gain. The Gray Merchant. In Ayara. The Murderous Rider, right? Timurit. It can buy a most lot of, of the money cards back. in this deck. Most of the cards in this deck gain life. Yeah, it, the like, only way to get rid of the treacherous blessings in this main deck are the two blast zones. Yeah, I mean, if you look, I mean, even Noxious Grasp, right, out of the sideboard is is potentially generating life. So, uh, I I think this is this might be pretty good, right? So treacherous blessing, yeah, if you instead got it, of Bolas the Citadel, um, it does much. It does let you play 24 land, apparently, though. I think that, you know, the the paint isn't dry on Mono Black. I think probably we're going to find ourselves collectively in a place where uh, it's going to be decided which cards are, are real good. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm not a believer in Blast Zone, personally. That's a, a, a colorless making land in a deck that's got a lot of stuff like Ayara. And... <laughs> You know, is really intensely interested in having lands that can produce black. I understand it's only two with twenty-two black producing lands, but I'm just not a believer yet. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'll be proven wrong. Man, once you're going to play Treacherous Blessing, it, there sure are a lot of new support cards for Treacherous Blessing in red. You know, like for instance, uh, I mean, again, I wonder if you could play some sort of Judith deck or something. But, like, there's Final Flare, which is that two and a red instant uh, sack a creature or enchantment, deal five damage to target creature. 
What a perfect way to sacrifice your treacherous blessing. Oh, I don't hate that at all. I do not hate right. that Right, and at then all. there's... Uh, totally, totally. And then uh, there's the uh, one in a red. Uh, one, I guess it's the uh, blood aspirant, one in a red for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a plus one, plus one counter on blood aspirant. And you can pay one in a red, tap, and sacrifice a creature or an enchantment. Blood Aspirant deals one damage to a creature. That creature can't block this turn. Uh, could, now, could like, you'd, have to, you'd have to be playing a lot of other sacrifice stuff, but this guy's got com- like combos, right? Like This guy's like good with the Witch's Oven stuff and Judas stuff and the sac- – like we've already been playing that for dr- – like uh, the, the, the more expensive way to ping off of each of the sacrifices, putting plus one, plus one counters on your – Two drop is like a pretty nice way to also capitalize on all those same events. So uh, on that on that kind of thread, um, you know, maybe not the uh, exact cards you're talking about, but I think black red might have have some legs. Uh, there was another five O deck that shared a lot of the cards that we've been talking about so far, but was in black red instead of mono black. Sebastian Pozo uh, coming off of a recent IRL. Uh, Top top performance, five owing a league with uh, kind of a black red witches oven deck. It's similar to I think some of the decks that were predating Theros Beyond Death. It's got it's got really this is a this is a deck that I think Sam Black and Tom Martell would love, uh, and it's also taking advantage of you know some of the some of the new cards from Theros Beyond Death. So this deck's got Cauldron Familiar Witches Oven, and it's got Claim the Firstborn right. So that's awesome right so you one mana threaten somebody and then you can get them with it and then witch's oven potentially take advantage of cards like midnight reaper priest of forgotten gods this card this deck has all four woe striders though so i'm in love with it because it's got woe strider for the mayhem devil and really the reason that i like it the best is that it has two rick's Mati revelers who we have not seen in standard in forever but i'm a big fan Dude, are you buying the the Acroan War? Um, I I don't. Know. Which is oven does make it better, I guess. Like, I I don't know. I, this is one of those cards that like you look at it and like, oh, what a novel one of inclusion. And then you know, does this card ever make it to the to the mature version of the deck? Right? It has like two Rick's Mati Revelers, one Rankle. Probably you'll figure out that there's something better than one copy of the Acroan War, but. You know, Crone Wars Chapter 1 is gain control of target creature for as long as the Crone War remains on the battlefield. So that's kind of a poly threaten. Um, you know, I kind of kind of could live with it. It's uh, it's clearly good with Witches of, and it's clearly good. Or, with... or Priest. Yeah, Priest. So what, once you're going to go to this trouble, man, like, is it crazy to try talking about any of that black red stuff? Like the engine we talked about? Slaughter Priest and Mogis, too. There's that one's one. You could play a Slaughter Priest of Mogis if you're like a little kind of aggressive. But I guess this one's trying to be more the Cauldron Familiar Witch's Oven style than the Judith action. Yeah, but I do think so. But just on that point, there's a second Acro and War on the sideboard. So I think Sebastian Pozo was a fan of that card. Um, it, I don't, it's some, some stuff's kind of weird to me. Like there's one Tybalt in the sideboard and like three Black Lance Paragons. Black Lance Paragon... I, I love that card, but I think it's a little out of place here, right? It, does it have any combo friends? I guess Midnight Reaper. That's it? Just Midnight Reaper. So Blacklands Paragon is just going to be like a, a solo lightning helix rather than, you know, a lot yeah, of but that, that can be pretty good. Yeah, but I think like a lot of the time when Blacklands Paragon shines, it's like when your opponent like swings with multiple knights. One of them is, you know, the world champion who's like only a one, one first strike. And you're like, all right, I'm going to just going to chomp this with my two, two let in five damage or whatever. And then they're like black Lance Paragon. And then, you know, the first strike and the death touch and the lifelink combined to ruin your two, two. I, th- I think that's like a, where a lot of the, a lot of the value of that card comes in. But, you know, if you're just going to bring it in defensively, um, I don't know. It's just, I guess, I guess a lightning helix is fine. It's not always Lightning Helix, though. It has Death Touch, man. You can just do it to your own... To, the Black Lance Paragon does it to itself, and it can terminate a green fatty. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and gain life, right? So it's also it's like a, yeah. like a big-time Lightning Helix. It's like it's like a, a two-mana, three-life Vraska's Contempt sometimes. 
So do you like this style, like the Cauldron Familiar Witches Oven style of black bread better than Knight's style of black bread? I, like Yama Killer took to a fifth place finish back over in the lead, or in the standard challenge? So um, I I think that I like the not oh, – it's hard. I love Ember Cleave. I love Ember Cleave. Um, I think that Knight's obviously is – tremendous level of synergy I, I think i like the black red just regular better than the knights right now um like this deck doesn't have like any great new cards does it i think this is just coming from prior to the prior well to that's the and that's i guess what i'm trying to say is the that's kind of like the bar a little bit right like that's uh that's a little bit the the challenge here is that there's such diverging styles too right yeah I, I mean, I think that I like Claim the Firstborn into Witch's Oven a lot. Like, that seems really powerful to me. Um, I also like Embercleave a lot. So, I mean, there's no reason you can't play them both, you know, depending on... Why Why would you not play Careless Celebrant? Isn't Careless Celebrant awesome in this kind of... In, in not the Knight deck, but in the Sacrifice, in the Cauldron Familiar Witch's Oven deck? So, tell me about Careless Celebrant. So, like, Forge used uh, three copies of it, and it's one in red for a 2-1 Seder Shaman. When it dies, it deals two damage to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. You ever play Festering Goblin? This is, like, the best Festering Goblin. This does two instead of one. And it's a 2-1 and it's a two one for two. I guess, you know what? It's It can't deal damage to face, though, right? It can't. So the thing that about Careless Celebrant that I think is pretty interesting is it can trade up real well, right? Like, so this can take up oh, yeah. a toughness creature. Um, it's also like, I guess, when you're combining it with Woe Strider or Witch's Oven, it's like a portable shock, right? Like you invest two mana into like a 2-1 beater that people probably don't want to block that often, right? Because it only has one toughness, but it like basically kills whatever because it can kill a four toughness. Um, and they kind of like let it go, but if you've got sacrifice outlet later, you can just get them with it. It's also a good combo with Nightmare Shepherd. Uh, it's a fantastic combo with Nightmare Shepherd. Talk to me. I mean, so I love the inclusion of Rick's Mighty Reveler in some of these black red decks, but like, why? It's it's not particularly synergistic with anything they've got going on. It's not like a recursion card for them. It's not contributing to, to devotion to black. I think it's just like, I hate to use these words, a good card. Is that? No, 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 no. No, there's stuff going on here. So first of all, the selection is very, so the most important thing is the refill. Because this deck is pretty low to the ground. And you really do empty out your hand. The fact, like the, the, uh, being able to actually spectacle Rick's Mahdi Reveler is just awesome here. As an option, you know, being able to actually have that longevity to try to swing things after, like if somebody sweeps the board, Rick's Muddy Reveler can just be such a key way to come back. But second of all, even just the discard a card and then draw a card, we're talking about a deck that has some very, very targeted, like they have some cards that are A's in some matchups and D's in other matchups. (laughs) Like, uh, Careless Celebrant is not what you want against a lot of control decks. Or Drag to the Underworld, for instance. You know? Like, the uh, the idea that you could actually just uh, keep the card flow going, but also just upgrade the cards that you have that line up wrong. And e- either way, being able to just cycle through cards is upside anyway, because you want cards to exile to your Woe Strider. And that's, you know, not even speaking to the possibility of sticking Cauldron Familiar in your graveyard where it's, you know, safe and sound. Yeah. But, uh, the other thing is, I guess this deck, because of the presence of cards like Cauldron Familiar and some of the interactions that you have with sacrifice effects, right? You've got Witch's Oven and you've got, um, uh, you've got Priest of Forgotten Gods to set up, you know, Careless Celebrant or actually maybe not Careless Celebrant, but like anyway, you've got stuff like Cauldron Familiar. You can you can uh, ting the opponent not with not in combat, 
So maybe it's a little easier to set up Brixmati Reveler for a deck with some such small creatures also. What do you mean set it up? Just to get oh, the, just, uh, just to get the spectacle on. Get the ping? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Spectacles Spectacle's always been easy decks like this. A lot of these decks play drill bit. And they all play it either main or side. Yeah. Just because it's easy enough to get the uh, the spectacle. Oh, I, this deck is another Cavalier of Night deck. So this is a... It, so do you think you want four copies of Fabled Passage in this deck? There's only two. And I feel like if, the, if ever there was a four Fabled Passage deck, I think this might be one of them. Nah, I don't know. Nah, this deck has one drops and stuff, man. Yeah, Maybe. but it also has... like That's just a freebie with Mayhem Devil. I guess it could be. It could be worth it, but it might, I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to see how it plays out because I sure do love having lands coming to play untapped. Um, there's another mono black version of a black devotion deck, three bullets, a citadel, etc. But this one's kind of an interesting twist. Azur 09's ninth place list just us at the top eight. Not only do they have four Yarrax Fenlurker, they got four Burglar Rats. Yeah. And obviously, they're still packing the four Nightmare Shepherds, but the um, they they also have four Lazartop Reaver. So this is one that's like really, really – and then three Woe Strider, which I would play for given how hard they're going all in on this. But this is a version that's really getting its money out of Nightmare Shepherd. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I would definitely play four Woe Strider in this strategy. Um, it You know, there's four ARs already, but like – Talk about a deck that it just, you know, Burglar Rat, Gray Merchant, Lazatep Reaver, um, Yarox Fenlurker. Like, half the cards in this deck are just 187 synergy cards for. They're just a great setups, right? Like, setting up Nightmare, or I guess Synergistic with Nightmare Shepherd, setting up um, Ayara. They're great hits off Bolas of Citadel. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think I think this might be closer to. The mature version of mono black. Although I'm a little concerned, like this deck is, it's I hate to say one dimensional because it's not. It can clear the opponent's hand, but not you know if the opponent hits a creature, especially a large creature, I don't feel like it's not going anywhere, right? There's there's uh, some murderous riders and that's it. So uh, El Yalo's twenty third list, man. I imagine you being kind of conflicted. So uh, on the upside, this black red cauldron familiar, which is of a deck, played four copies of Crocs, a Titan of Death's Hunger. It certainly did. <laughs> you got to be so happy about that, oh, right? Oh, I like it. I like now, it a lot. Now, how do you feel about the lack of a certain three drop? There's zero copies of your woe of your uh, your woe strider and zero copies of Ayara. Although it's more justifiable in a deck that's got six mountains, right? Definitely. Um, I I'm not conflicted at all. I think you, they you like Cruxa. No, you I think both? there should just be woe striders in this deck and not Cruxa. No, I think we can move something else. Like, I, Rankle, I think, is probably an underperformer in this strategy. You can only play so many escape cards, man. Yeah, but, like, what's Rankle doing here? Like, Rankle's fine. Like, Rankle's not at, at Yeah, his but how many, how many escape cards are you going to play? I mean, how many escape cards are... Oh, so there's already four, four Cruxa. Yeah, but, like, I feel like you want... Woe Strider because he's good with Claim the Firstborn. Right? Okay. He's good with Cauldron Familiar. He's good with Gutter Bones. Or you, 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 you need him, right? I don't know. Like, I, I don't, like, I don't think this deck needs four Midnight Reaper just for sake of argument. If you're going to split up the threes a little bit, Midnight Reaper. Like, I don't know. This card is such bad. Like, you draw multiples in some matchups. You just don't want them. I feel like this is like a classic one over two of card that you want. It's like stats are like literally fine. <laughs> like, oh, a three, two for three. I agree. If it has a great ability, I'll play some. All right. This one has a very good ability. How many do I want to draw? Not four. So we talked about playing red or not playing red earlier. Game Boy to, uh, 27. Uh, 
play uh, it was the highest finishing mono red aggro deck with a uh, mono red using uh, four copies of Infuriate, which is the you know eighty seven percent of a giant growth. <laughs> red for creature gets plus three plus two until end of turn. Yeah, and then uh, uh, four Robber of the Rich. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, for Runaway Steamkin, for Phoenix of Ash, for Fervent Champion, for Scorch Spitter, for Tin Street Hooligan, zero Torben, for Light Up the Stage, for Shock, for Embercleave, three Castle Emberth, and 17 Mountains. So lots of uh, lots of one ones for one, that's for sure. Well, this deck has got, a, I think its thing is it's got a lot of haste, right? Fervent Champion, haste. Phoenix of Ash, haste. Robber of the Rich, Haste, Scorch Spitter, not Haste, but Tin Street Dodger, Haste, right? So one, two, three, four, five. You know, four out of the six classes of creatures have Haste, which is very good with Infuriate and can be very good with Embercleave. So um, I think... Which, incidentally, Infuriate Mondo combo with Embercleave. Oh, yeah, that's like plus eight or something, right? (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah. Embercleave is just the best, Patrick. I don't know what to tell you on this card. It's the battlefield. If you're tapped out, you pretty much just take 100 damage. Um, I think Robber the Rich is, generally speaking, underplayed. Uh, that said, this deck does not strike me as the most consistent strategy you can be playing in Standard. Um, I feel like you blow people out when you go first, and when you go second, stuff like your Robber isn't even online. If you're going second, uh, you can get chunky draws with, like, Phoenix of Ash. Uh, this is not a remarkable Runaway Steamkin deck. It's pretty good. I guess there's three classes of one-drops that, you know, offensive one-drops. And then I guess the support spells are largely one-drops, but it's not the best. Like, it's weird to me to see a deck like this that just doesn't have Bone Crusher Giant. You know, Bone Crusher Giant. I, I, I still can't get into that. You, like, shock over Bone Crusher Giant seems insane to me. Yeah, Bone Crusher Giant is just... It's obviously a less good shock than shock. Um, it's Maybe. A, a better everything else than everything it's else. a lot in deck. better of a 4-3. It's like a lot better creature than all these creatures. <laughs> and it's uh, still a pretty good shock. That's, uh, that's my assessment. Also, this deck is kind think, of... Uh, this style with all the haste... It's, I mean, I don't know. I, like I said, I think this deck is going to be inconsistent. It's going to mess some people up, and it's like, it, it's fine. Do you like this all haste style better than like uh, Cherry X Man uh, with four Grim Initiate and four Rimrock Knight and uh, four Weaselback Red Cap? Um, I. I, I think I must like it better than a deck with Weasel Cap, Weaselback Red Cap. So I'm going to go with a yes on that. Kind of interesting, right? Weasel Cap Red, like Re, Weaselback Red Cap. Like, you think is that really worth it? I, I mean, mean you get the bonus from the Fervent Champion, but you don't. I mean, I, I guess like you don't get the Mentor ability of the Goblin. But like you know, Cherry X Man's deck is like. I mean, I hate to put it this way, like mostly very bad cards, right? Like there's not even shock in this deck. Forget about Bone Crusher Giant. Its spells are barge in and infuriate, (laughs) right? That's like one claim the firstborn with, as far as I can tell, no synergies, right? So... Well, kill him. Okay. (laughs) It's not a consistent draw. I'm not sure if that's better or worse than land number 20 in this deck. Uh, four Castle Embereth in a 19 land deck seems fantastic. And in a deck that's as one drop dependent as this one, I can see you getting so screwed. Like, what if your lands are two Castle Embereth? Right? Like, no, hey, for what it's worth, two copies of this exact list made the top 32. What do I know? Um, I mean, Grim Initiate just doesn't seem like a good card to me. As far as the non-red decks go, uh, first of all, help me understand what's going on with this particular Neoform deck. 
the fourth place Jake Helms uh, Elementals deck with uh, Omnath Locus of the Royal. Uh, the new thing is Thassa Deep Dwelling. There's Neoforms in here, but then there's Claim the Firstborn in the Acroan War. And uh, as far as I can tell, the whole thing with the Acroan War, I guess, is ostensibly Neoform? Or is it new combos with Thassa? You see, Thassa has, at the beginning of your end step, exile up to one other target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under your control. So when you've got Thassa Deep Dwelling in play, which already combos with the rest of your deck because you can reset your Cavalier Thorns, reset your Omnath, reset your Risen Reef, and just keep drawing extra cards that way. Uh, but when you've got Thassa in play, Claim the Firstborn or the Acroan War gives you control magic because whatever you steal, you can blink out and now it's yours. I think you answered the question. That seems fantastic. It's very powerful. Like that's a really great way to do it, right? In a color combination that doesn't traditionally have access to very good of removal. Um, I I agree with that statement. That said, I think that largely with this engine, I might be tempted to go straight blue green instead of blue green red. I mean, you're so far ahead with just Thassa Cavalier of Thorns. Like that's insane how powerful that is, right? Like you're you're filling whatever you want to fill. Um, and I think like if you're doing it that way, instead of playing some of these red cards, you just play the, uh, the blue green escape guy, right? Like, aren't you just going to set him up if you, if you're blinking Cavalier of Thorns with, uh, with Thassa Deep Dwelling? Maybe. I mean, if it comes to that, I think once you're actually successfully blinking Cavalier of Thorns, that's not necessarily the spot where you need that much more help. Yeah. But I mean, just, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess you're so far ahead when you're doing this already, right? Like both of those cards are just generating enormous advantage for you. The spot where I wonder why we can't play that, uh, the blue green Titan is in like, uh, Ches Chelio's seventh place list, which is, uh, uh, soul tie ramp deck. It, so for ramping, I mean, so the only black in the deck, just to be clear, it's mostly a green deck. The only black in the deck is death sprout and casualties of war. And the only blue in the deck is Hydroid, Crassus, Aether Gust, and Growth Spiral. The rest of the deck is just a green Nissa who shakes the world with acceleration of Voracious Hydra sort of deck. But uh, I like this deck a lot. It, this is a, a person who knows what they want in life, right? And I but why that. don't they don't they want the Titan? I, why would you not want the Titan? Uh, I think like you're probably right. They probably want the Titan, they, but they didn't know it yet. Like, ah, the good point. You think you're just going to edge out like a couple voracious Hydras or something for the Titan? Here, here's my thinking on this deck. This deck has got very good redundancy at the two, right? You've got Paradise Druid. I'm not playing Aether Gust. I'm not going to play four Aether Gust main deck. I think there's way too much mono black. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's I, I, I played some Aether Gusts when I qualified, but it was a different world. Everyone was playing either Jeskai or... Jund or blue green, you always had targets. Um, now, I think maybe zero Aether Gust main deck is the right number. Um, but anyway, this deck's got four growth spiral and four paradise druids, so pretty intense acceleration at the two to set them up for death sprout, right? They're accelerating to your acceleration. Boom, you're there already. And, you know, I guess death sprout's a little hard to cast on turn three because of the double black, but. The implication is very strong for like setting up casualties of war. You know, any of these machinery decks are just really, really messed up. You know, you can get you can get their enchantment, whatever enchantment that is. You can get their witches oven. You get a guy. It's, I, I just think casualties of war is an incredible card still. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, now that you're talking about the blue green titan, maybe we don't play four casualties of war. Because like they're both powerful cards, so you don't need to cast uh, multiple. Casualties. I'm I, I'm playing four casualties of war. Yeah, this deck's got four voracious Hydra, four Nissa. I, yeah, I don't know that I need four Hydra voracious. Classes. I could trim. I could trim some Hydra. Okay. I don't. You. Know, I don't think you have to play the many of the Titan either. The first couple you play. See, 
my thinking is at least you want to play Cavalier of Thorns in the sideboard. There's no Cavalier of Thorns anywhere in the 75. I would play Cavalier of Thorns. Like Cavalier of Thorns is just so good. Like you can you can get half your yeah, acceleration well. game on and miss the other half and you're just still there. So what I I, 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 I think the, guy. the big puzzle is going to be figure out how to replace Aether Gust. That's the big thing, I think. I don't know. Maybe we just trim all four Aether Gusts and, and play four Titans. I mean, look, you can just play the Titan on three. It's fine. No? So there's this exciting new... Oh, no, you could. Yeah. I, I don't think you want to lean that hard on the Titan in a deck like this. Once you got the three colors, I think. But there's uh, uh, an Asiac Nightmare Muse deck in the top eight. Tutu Zeno's eighth place list with three... Co- it's an Esper... Uh, sort of board control deck you know it's got no permission it's just it's got thought thought erasure to kind of mess up their hand but it's mostly just removal and then hero of precinct one and then uh getting advantage from Ashiox into fairies it's well, got your beloved oath of Kea, but it's also got for a card advantage for atris oracle of half truths so this and two, yeah this is just remarkable to me Last week we were having this argument. You're just like, well, argument, you know, spirited discussion. And I actually got convinced from what we were talking about that Aegis is just worse than not elite guard mage, right? No, I no, I didn't say that. It's a more power. I I and I tried telling you last week. I'm I'm not saying it's worse. It's just different. I it, after we were talking, it really felt worse to me. But you know what? Here of Re- Precinct wanted to Atris is here. It is a four and a four. Power to Atris. I love yeah. this card. Three, two, yeah, minus fun. four. Factor Fiction yeah. Team. Yeah, we'll see how long it lasts. But yeah, I love it's it. Not it's as one of my favorite cards. As a, as a non elite guard mage, I think. I think you were right. Dude, so Ashiok. I love it this week. Ashiok looks pretty good in this deck. Yeah. If you're, yeah, if you can just use a little bit of removal, buy some time. If you drop Ashiok, that's a pretty good way to go over the top of somebody. Uh, I think this deck has got so many things that are good, like really just work, right? So Hero of Precincts 1 at the 2, if you look at this, 3 Ashiox, blue-black, 4 Teferis, white-blue, 4 Atris, blue I mean, the faster thing is just every single card in the deck is gold except for Hero of Precincts 1. That's true. That's what I was getting at. Everybody's gold. So if you get Hero of Precincts 1 and any spells in this deck, you are on your way. If there is a criticism I would make of this deck, and you know I'm not even 100% there, I would play way more copies of D-Spark. There's only one D-Spark in the sideboard. Well, you can't play... No, there's, that's because there's three in the main deck. Oh. Wow, You're out of control, dude. You yes. can't play any more copies. This is Are the you saying you want to... number of D-Sparks, then. Okay, now we're talking. I was going to say, how many more do you want him to play? Like, you could... They could play the fourth main deck, I guess, but like I thought three plus one was a strong statement. That's that's good, then. I'm in for this. I somehow missed the fact that there were all four D Sparks, despite the fact that I was running down the list of gold cards. Um, yes, D Spark. I think it, I think D Spark is just great in standard right now, and moreover, it's it's obviously super great in a in a gold card theme deck, right? So. I mean, just the number of insane permanents that you can destroy with D-Spark permanently, preventing them perhaps from escaping next turn is at an all-time high relative to the the amount of time D-Spark has been legal and standard. Yeah, I think D-Spark looks like it's the best it's been. Uh, Actually, another thing you could D-Spark, it's kind of inefficient, but uh, Elspeth conquers death out of the sideboard. What do you think of this? Um, I'm... I'm not super in love with this card. I actually like the other Elspeth uh, saga better. better. Yeah, I mean, so Elspeth Conquers Death, Chapter 1, Exile Target Permanent, and Opponent Controls with Converted Mana Cost 3 or Greater. So you're playing... You get D-Spark! Five. D-Spark on the way in! You get the better D-Spark on the way in! You do, you do. And it exiles it. So Yeah, it could be, even if they have 5, though, you can just target the one you want. Uh, yeah, but th- what do you think about the other two clauses on this? Non-creature spells your opponent's cast cost two more to cast until your next turn. I'm like, eh? Uh. Well, that's not that's not where the power is. That's because when you play Elspeth uh, Conqueror's Death, you kill the Planeswalker they tapped out to play, and now they can't play anything juicy on their next turn. 
And then on your next turn, you get to play target creature or planeswalker from your graveyard and then and put a plus one, plus one counter or a loyalty counter on it. Like, I mean, this is going to sound stupid, but you have to have one, right? You have to have one? Yeah. Yeah, but so what? This is a five drop. Why, do, why would we not have one? Might not have one. I, I think the card is, I'm just not that enthused by it. Maybe I'll be, I, I really just, I look at this and I'm like, seems expensive and inconsistent to me. This doesn't look like the Eldest Reborn to you? The Eldest Reborn seems a lot, like, I feel like the Eldest Reborn just does its thing way more consistently than this card for pretty similar, pretty similar conditions from top to bottom of the card. The, the Eldest Reborn just, just does it. Well, so, okay, so chapter one, you got to give it to Elspeth Conquer's Death. Exile target permanent an opponent controls with converted mana cost three or greater. Definitely better than uh, the Eldest Reborn's Edict effect. Chapter two, you got to give the Eldest Reborn, though. By a mile. It's not even close. The Eldest Reborn also crushes chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. I think Eldest Reborn, I, I feel like overall is a much better card. And the fact that, like, you would play Eldest Reborn mess them up for their best card, and then take their best card, which happened all the time, is, I mean, that that was just such a game winner. That was, like, the way to finish games for decks that were topping up on that card. I think, like, Elspeth Conquer's Death, I, maybe it's way more strategic than I'm giving it credit for. Like, maybe you wait for them to get, you know, use their removal card on your powerful permanent, and then you use this to rebuy it. But Or maybe you go ultimate on a Planeswalker and they had it back this way. I I love the two dream trawlers in here. I'm into it. Oh, I'm I'm just into this deck is. I think this deck is where it's at. Uh, I dude, I love the twenty seven land. Also, that's discipline. Twenty seven land because when your cards are this powerful, hit your land drops, man. Um, what do you think about only one castle locked Wayne for castles though? Like I, if you're going to, I, I like it. Land, I'm not that into, I'm not that into the castles in the three color version. I think you can play some temples instead. And obviously the more temples you play, the harder it is to play any castles. How about, um, four temples? Like, are you thinking that's the right number of temples? Cause I almost feel I like, like I mean, I'd want more temples. You can play five. Well, I don't know. I, I definitely want to play – you see, I think I think 22 of the spots are locked in because I'm definitely playing 12 Shocklands, definitely playing two of each basic and four Fabled Passage. Maybe I'm not playing two of each basic. I'm certainly playing the first one of each basic, but I think the second one's pretty good in a lot of these cases. But I want to be able to have enough basics to support four Fabled Passage. Fabled Passage looks amazing here. And so once you're playing four Fable Passage, uh, 12 Shocklands, and then call it six basics, you only got room for four temples in a castle, or you could play five temples, I guess. Um, or are you wanting to shave one basic? I was thinking about shaving Fable Passage, but... No! All right, dude, I think you might You have... need it! You need that one. All right, let's That's just, your Tri-Land. Let's assume that the mana base is good in this deck. I do have a... a... Two things to note on this deck we haven't mentioned. One, your Mortifies that you, you know, I guess like a little bit ago you talked about how good you thought Mortify might be in standard. Mortify, flexible removal spell, can also take out powerful enchantments. Sometimes people play their entire deck around a key enchantment. Um, Mortify is there for you. But I do think there's something that maybe is missing. On the sweeper front, there's one time wipe. I guess you can count Liliana Dreadhorde General. What are you thinking about this? This is a color combination that is rich with sweepers and standard. Yeah, it's a little surprising to me. I would have thought that there would be like at least three like, after sideboarding. What do you think about Kaya's Wrath in this deck? Now, there's kind of two too many islands for Kaya's Wrath or one too many island for Kaya's Wrath? Nah, no, I, I could still be in for Kaya's Wrath. I like Kaya's Wrath, man. What do you think about trading in one of those islands for another temple and then? Although actually, I no, nah, I think I might like time white better more in this deck because I don't know that you're actually going to be in the biggest hurry to have to sweep on turn four, and I think 
I, I mean, maybe I'm just a little kid, but my dream, all I've ever wanted is to time wipe my Atreus Oracle of Half-Truths back to my hand. I mean, if you're a little kid, how do how am I, if I think my curve should be Teferi Atreus time wipe so that I could do it at instant speed? I'm into that. <laughs> Uh, we talked last week um, about some of the uh, the implications of enchantments, and obviously Dream Trawler. But like uh, Kev Slinger's five O list from uh, the Standard League, so in, like doesn't need black. So it's a Dream Trawler to Fairy deck that has a very different angle. First of all, not short on sweepers with four copies of Shatter the Sky, but. Um, this is the inch, this is a style of enchantment based blue white that takes advantage of thirst for meaning. It's got four the birth of Miletus after your own heart, four banishing light because of, and four omen of the sea after my heart. Uh, what do you what do you what's your take on this one, man? Um, I think like. I think that this this is also a deck that's got to got to come in coming together. Um, I, I don't know. Like, do you think these are conf, like conflicting incentives? Nah, nah, dude. So, uh, first of all, twenty six land with four Omen of the Sea and four the Birth of Miletus. Man, are you going to hit your land drops? I love it. I love it. But it's not like this deck's just going to flood out straight out because. The Birth of Miletus also gives you other action. Omen of the Sea gives you other action. And then out of your lands, you've got two Castle Ardenvale, a Labyrinth of Scophos for Temple of Enlightenment. And besides, you really want to hit all your land drops anyway. And a bunch of these enchantments, you're just going to be pitching to Thirst for Meaning anyway. You really want to draw one too many. This deck's got some Jerry T in it, too. With the, I'm digging it, too. The one Heliod's Intervention and two Thassa's Intervention. Jerry's been talking about playing a copy of Heliod's Intervention in a lot of decks. Just having that out to, you know, having a card that you could dig to that lets you just blast multiple artifacts and enchantments, so nice. And then anybody that doesn't have artifacts and enchantments, it's just the possibility of target player gains X life. Having that added twice dimension. Twice X life, right? Well, twice <laughs> X life, right. I mean, for six mana, you just gain eight life at instant speed. Very, very, very exciting. So, um, is this deck? And getting, then, uh, yeah, is this deck getting a bonus on Shatter the Sky, ish? Right from Dream Trawler, do you think Shatter the Sky is going to take take substantial place in Standard now? Well, I mean, uh, Shatter the Sky doesn't really work that well with Dream Trawler. I mean, I mean the Dream Trawler is going to die. Yeah, but you know, draw a card first. Yeah, but that's not when you want to shatter the sky. You got a dream trawler. Shatter the sky is just being played because it costs four as opposed to time wipes five. This deck doesn't have anything to bounce with time wipes, so you'd way rather shatter the sky and risk the possibility that your opponent's going to draw a card sometimes. Because whenever they they do draw a card, it also implies that your shatter the sky got extra value. I think shatter the sky looks quite strong. So, what do you think about? Only white castles in this deck, no blue castles. Blue castles overrated. Really? Yeah, but I, I would still play blue castle in a lot of decks in a lot of situations. I don't know that I would only play two castle Arden Vale here. Uh, I kind of like playing a blue castle, and in general, I prefer playing one of each castle rather than two castle Arden Vales. What do you think about Labyrinth of Scophos? I, I, I into almost, it. You're into it. I'm into it. I think one copy of this is a nice move. I think this is a nice move. It depends. You can only play so much of this kind of stuff. Like, but I like, feel like Castle Ardenvale does the same thing a lot of the time. Not in the air. Not in the air? Give not it, in the air. You. So the the engine here is basically like four Banishing Light, four Omen of the Sea, four Birth of Miletus, and Thirst for Meaning, right? That's like a big part of it. But you can just that's be, the engine, yeah. You just be discarding stuff that you don't want, right, to get to the cards you do want. Like yeah, playing, but most of the time you want to discard an enchantment. It's just so good. Yeah, like I feel like this deck is missing like a like a big ending, right? I like guess Dream Thassa's Trawler? intervention is the big ending. 
Sort of. That's not really a big ending. That's just like a draw to. It's, mo- it's like a, for three mana, it's like a weird counter spell that's unreliable, but it gets uh, expensive. But then it also can be a draw to. See what I'm saying? Like this deck has got like 26 lands. It's got Dream Dreamfaller is not a big ending card. Like, it's powerful. I mean, if you're playing against Mono Red, sure. It's, they are never going to remove it. And it's going to destroy them, right? Well, I would play. I would play one f- uh, finale, like a blue finale. Like, don't you, don't you think this deck is missing like a blue finale? Well, like, I would play one blue finale definitely instead of one Thassa's intervention. Maybe like I feel like this deck might be king of the mid game. Entire format. Nobody's better on like you know turns three through ten or something than this deck, but like. The problem is this deck has to play 20 turns, and after turn 10, like the blue-green deck's just like, is that all you got? And then they just start, you know, escaping you out and casting giant uncounterable threats and just start landing haymaker planeswalkers, drawing more cards than you. You know, like you see, you think, see what I'm saying on that one? Like, yeah. it's just like, all right, if we if we end the game on turn nine, I got you. But there's like two ways to do that quickly. Well, I like Finale in here instead of the second Thassa's Intervention or something, but I think it depends on how much do you want Thassa's Intervention to be a draw to versus how much do you want to be a counterspell. Do you think this deck is just explicitly missing Brazen Borrowers? Is no. that a thing? You could play it, but I don't think it's explicitly missing it. I don't think you necessarily need it. Like Banishing Light just does enough of that job for you? And Heliod's Intervention. And shatter the sky being faster, like being faster than time wipe. Um, are you in for? I, I I frequently I think there's nothing wrong with playing some brazen burrow in here if you want, but I also don't think it's out of the question not to. And I think dream trawler kind of takes you on a path where you've got extra incentive to not play that kind of stuff. Uh, what do you think of Elspeth Sun's nemesis in the sideboard? Um, I got a figure that's kind of your jam. See, I feel like that's a weird sideboard card. I feel like I had rather just play at least one in the main deck and if i played one in the main deck i almost feel like it's it's giving me like my powerful card that i feel like i'm missing right now like mm. this card's inevitable uh there's a different kind of we, we touched on salt earlier but there's a different kind of salt deck um chaya jam played uh it, so only three casualties of war you know something you were alluding to but uh, four Cavalier Titan of Nature's Wrath, uh, four Cavalier of Thorns, but no uh, Thassas, but uh, four Polychronos Unchained. Talk to me about this deck, the 5 0 deck from uh, the Standard League. I thought the Polychronos was a little weird in this deck. 6 6 with super duper upside? Yeah. Is it the thing that I want to splash a color for? I guess I've got casualties. I guess Casualties of War is clearly the sacrifice. That's why you're sac- splashing. That's um, the splash. I feel like, look, this deck's already got four Uros. It's already got three Hydroid Krasis. It's got four Cavalier Thorns. You know what's weird? There's no Nisses in this deck. That's what's weird. I, I, I kind of... <laughs> okay, I'm off it. Look, I, Prolucranos is really weird to me. It gets fine. It's like... A good card. It seems way less good than some of the other things you could be playing in this color combination, starting with the most powerful card that you would potentially play in combination with Hydroid Crisis. Or, for that matter, Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath. Like, those guys get together in a hurry. Uh, did you see the white aggro deck that had uh, Elspis in the main? Oh, I did. Are you excited about that one? Top of one of those lists, right? Um, Ellie, uh, Elio's 5-0 list, a uh, mono-white, you know, there were some other mono-white aggro decks, like the the standard challenge winner had a mono-white deck, but and they're all based on heraldic banner, but the, mono, the, the, the standard challenge winner didn't have the Elspeth Sun's nemesis in the main deck. Elio, uh, Elio uh, did, however, and uh, some other new stuff, too. So this deck has got four copies of Elspeth Sun's Nemesis, despite playing only 20 lands, right? So like you said, there's Heraldic Banner, um, which I guess helps helps that out. I think that if I was in this in this strategy, I might just want to play four Heraldic Banners. It's not like it's legendary. 
But otherwise, this deck is, you know, very low to the ground. It's got, like, Fairy Guide Mother, which is one casting cost. Giant Killer, which is potentially one casting cost. Healer's Hawk. Oh, yeah. Rune Enforcer. Loyal Pegasus. Obviously, these decks all only only ever want to yeah. play. Yeah, dying you know somebody Hawk. serious. So, um, this is like a uh, Tom Ross-esque, white weenie little guys, and then go wide and give them some boost from Heraldic Banner or Elspeth and hopefully kill the opponent before they kill you. It's got Unbreakable Formation also to, to kind of push that along. Mm-hmm. A lot of tapping. Law Rune Enforcer and uh, Giant Killer. Yeah, Giant Killer is uh, like, an underrated card. Good with Fairy Godmother. It's too bad that Elspeth Snud's Nemesis doesn't work with the uh, Giant Killer. So Fairy Guide Mother has the ability to give target creature plus two plus one, but Elspeth Sun's Nemesis um, only gives plus two plus one to creatures that you control, right? So it yeah. makes it less synergistic with Giant Killer. Uh, what, do you like hush, uh, Hushbringers in the sideboard? Uh, I'm okay with Hushbringers in the sideboard. I think like Hushbringers do multiple things. They are lifelink creatures, so they're uh, in line with Healer's Hawk. What I think is really weird, if you're going to play that card for, I guess, you think you're more likely to play it for its its counter, the 187 ability, than than for its lifelink ability, right? I assume, yeah. How is there no Daxos in this deck? Like, I feel like, <laughs> like isn't this the deck that you want to play Daxos in? Like, is is Daxos like meaningfully worse than Eidolon of Obstruction? Like. <laughs> I don't know. Obstruction is a 2-1 first strike that might not have an ability. And its ability isn't that powerful, right? So a single Planeswalker will be charged one mana when you have Eidolon of Obstruction in play. Versus Daxos, who has, like, insane number of triggers in this deck and, like, infinite toughness. Uh, maybe you just really want to stop people from Teferiing you on turn three. I don't know. Maybe. Like, I mean, you have like a one turn, one turn <laughs> window, and then they just tap one, right? It's like, it's it's not a bad card. I'm, I'm not making that claim. I'm just thinking like, can we shave one and play one Daxos and then realize that we would like to play more than one Daxos in our deck that has four healers, Hawk, and four Hushbringers in the sideboard, and... Maybe we we come together and realize there's a six sub theme here. Uh, part of the reason I asked about Hushbringer, it's not this deck, but dude, when are we going to see Hushbringer with the Titans? Hushbringer with I, either Uro or uh, or your or, or Kruxa. You mean like, like with them? No, in with them. So if you go turn to Hushbringer, yeah. Then what happens when you play Kruxa? Or you play Euro? Oh, it, it counters the sacrifice. Yeah! Escaped clause? Yeah! So we're just like talking about playing like a, you know, a super undercosted 6-6? Six, six? Yeah. Oh, but we lose the other ability. No, you still have the attack trigger though. Oh, I could live with that. That's not That's bad. That's not bad. <laughs> That and then if you don't, if you, and it's not like you're, it's not like it's one of those combos that only works when you draw the pieces, because you still could have a Euro or a, uh, or, or Croxa. I think you got to go one way or the other. I don't think you want to be all five colors that way. <laughs> well, you but, know, Euro could get you to the, all the mana you need. It's, but, it's all good. But that's pretty sweet, right? Like you could play a Hushbringer deck and like, just be like, okay, when I draw the Hushbringer, Euro's just a six, six. That just has this unreal attack trigger. And you can still escape him, get him back and everything, too. Well, here's the problem, though. If you just play a Hushbringer on turn two, and your opponent happens to be playing, like, an Euro deck, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> Maybe. Depends on the rest of your deck, you know? I mean... I, I think that it is, at minimum, a novel idea. Uh, these are obviously both good cards, and when you put them together, maybe they're double-plus good. Dude, you could just be playing Croxa, just play Mardu, Mardu Croxa. I don't think there's enough support for Mardu. 
Don't believe uh, me. I would love to butcher the horde your face, but you know, I don't. I don't know that it's all there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, out of the uh, the decks, uh, there was one other one though. I mean, there were a few people playing Fires of Invention without anything really, you know, very without very much new. Um, but uh, there was a uh, where is it? There's one more deck. Um, uh, what do you think of Gadwick? Uh, by the way, just while I'm looking for it, what do you think of Gadwick in the uh, in some of these blue green decks? It's it's tough because there's Gadwick and then there's also the finale and the. I'm I'm looking at like random jewelers five O deck. So this deck has got like four Hydroid Crisis and four Voracious Hydra and four Casualties of War already. So like making room for Gadwick is it's a lot, right? Um, there's only one copy of Gadwick in the main deck, and I don't believe any copies of Gadwick in the sideboard. I'm really down for Gadwick, right? Like maybe if you play the straight blue green ramp, you can replace Casualties of War with Gadwick. But um, I don't know. Like you've already got like four Hydra Crisis and four Voracious Hydra in this build. Uh, it's it's that's a lot of X. Yeah. You know, like you just talk about the deck that's great on like, turn ten. You know this deck's great so, on turn ten, but you got to. I actually. Ahead. I actually think you want Gadwick only if you're playing. Like, I think the places for Gadwick are like um, possibly mono blue, possibly blue red, and possibly blue white. I think that once you play green, I think you actively do not want Gatwick. Really? Now, nowadays, yeah. So I have I have uh, played all those Gadwick strategies myself. I <laughs> I think Gadwick and mono blue. I started with not four. And then I quickly understood that four was correct because you could just play Gadwick on four mana and it was already like triggering all kinds of stuff that you wanted to have triggered. And just having it in play made all your cards are blue, right? So it was awesome. Um, Gadwick, I started two copies of Gadwick in blue red. Same story. Card was fantastic in blue red. And then in blue white, you're rewarded by playing Gadwick on three, right? So this was a super novel thing to me. Like, oh, what if I just played Gadwick and didn't actually draw any cards with it? Oh, wait, now my opponent can't attack me anymore. <laughs> this well, is pretty I, good. Gadwick, to me, seems nice for Blue Devotion. I mean, yeah, it has three blue pips and draws you into everything you might possibly want. Is there yeah. a, a legitimate Blue Devotion deck to be had, though? I uh, Possibly. I think as long as you can figure out how to not just get run over... Um, but actually, the, I found the other deck. This uh, on the topic of your your blessed Daxos, blessed by the sun. Uh, the twelfth place X file list was a uh, it, it was a little bit of a divergence. It's quite a bit different than the heraldic banner lists that we were seeing. This one's got four Ajani's pride mate, and part of the way that it's fueling it isn't just the healers hawks that uh, that we were expecting from above, and obviously Elspeth's son's nemesis. There's uh, four copies of. Al Seed of Life's Bounty and four copies of Heliod Sun Crowned and four copies of Linden the Steadfast Queen. This is a player, X File, who knows what they want in life. And what they want is for their key creature to live. Al Seed of Life's Bounty is going to be one of the key cards to come out of this set, in my opinion. Right? Like, can you imagine a better card to play like right after you already have a Satessan champion in play, right? Like it, it just, it does everything that you might want to have happen. And he does it for a really, really economical cost. So if you've got a card like a Johnny's pride mate, for example, that might get big, but is potentially vulnerable to removal, I'll see it of life's bounty. It, it just among like other things, right? It can stymie one removal spell it itself has lifelink, so it can help Ajani's pride mate grow. And I think very subtly and very importantly, in a deck like this, which has got four copies of Heliod Suncrowned, if the opponent only has one color of blocker, you can just sacrifice Alcide of Life's Bounty and kill them. Mm, that's interesting. Like I think that's like the thing, right? So people have got like, all right, my Ajani's pride mate keeps growing. Once it's like past four. Maybe it's real difficult to kill. I'm getting like 
minor minor triggers because I have Daxos Blessed by the Sun in play already, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. What's going to happen? Healer Sock's pinging you. Like, oh, okay, I have a 10-10, a Johnny's Pride Mate, you know, protection from red, just get you. Good game. I think that's that's what, what the, the real, real, you know, payoff of that card is going to be in, in some of these standard decks. You've convinced me. That That sounds fantastic when you put it that way. Uh, talk to talk to me about Linden. Oh man! Well, first of all, this card this card is really, really, really volatile, right? So it's a three, three for three in a deck that can't not cast it if it has three mana, right? So there's 21 planes in this deck. You not you know the three white pips are not going to bother you uh, as they might in some other decks. So other than the fact that there's 10 three drops in this 21 land deck, so. I think that this 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 one isn't fully baked. I think there's some really good ideas though. I mean, like if you're just like first turn Alcide, second turn Johnny's Pride Mate, third turn Linden, like your Pride Mate is going to be, I don't know, what is that, four four before damage, and then it's going to be five five minimum after damage. That's when you bad. The Helia Linden combo is pretty intense. Oh wow, yeah. I mean, but on the subject of multiple three drops. Here, here's the thing. Heliod is going to be online in this deck a fair bit, I think. Well, Heliod's unbelievable in this deck. Yeah, like, this is just a 5-5 five, five for 3 with a ton of abilities, including indestructible. So, I mean, if you just think about, like, the value of Heliod here in a deck that's got so many life gain triggers, I mean, Heliod, I mean, what if Heliod was just a creature you decided to, uh, to make big, right? So, just keeps accumulating plus one, plus one counters, and then you just use Alcide to, to get it in, and that's it. It's a good game, man. Uh, notably, both Heliod and Alcide could destroy a treacherous blessing if it ever came to that. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, but, dude, uh, there's there's like 0% chance that you're supposed to play zero Castle of Arden Vale, right? Uh, yes, I think that zero is the correct... The correct uh, assessment of the zero in the in this actual deck also i think this deck is light on tomic distinguished advocates there are two copies on the sideboard i think this deck wants four between main deck and sideboard first of all wow tomic is ww that's two white pips for heliod um two three flying for two not bad uh, don't forget, Tomic's got some additional text. Lands on the battlefield and land cards in graveyards can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponents control. This card literally turns off the best card in the color green by itself. Uh, I think, like, you know, pair that with the fact that it's a 2 3 flying for two. Uh, and, you know, your opponents can't play land cards from the graveyards. Is, that's a pretty minor additional ability, I think. But the first one is. Just turn not being able to use yeah, not being able to use Nissa. I mean, yeah, Nissa, not sorry, Elspeth. Um, that's it's so huge. Yeah, yeah. Plus a two three flyer for two is kind of a hard body. That's good. The last deck worth talking about today, I think, because we kind of touched the other archetypes, is a Nissa deck. And this is just another blue green uh, ramp deck, but it's a little different. It's got two finale of devastation, uh, one thoughts of deep dwelling. And you kind of alluded to this style before where you cut the red elements. It's got four Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. And the, you can the, the, the one Thassa Deep Dwelling is interesting in context with the two fa- Finale of Devastation. And then there's also two, uh, I'm sorry, one End Raise Forerunners as an end game boom boom when you have unlimited mana. So this is like just kind of an update to the Quasi Duplicate deck. Yeah. Um, which it actually, but it's for Uro. It's it's really doing it, and then one Thassa is such a good target. I think is Endray's Forerunners really where you want to be. I think so. I guess what else would you play? Yeah, it's. I think it's just such a way to turn Finale into a win. I mean, I feel like I just want a fourth Hydroid Crassus a lot of the time, right? Well, I'm playing. I would play for Hydroid Crassus. <laughs> I just like I think you can get that from it. You can get that from somewhere else. I would play for Hydrocrasses. I'm just saying, I think that once you're going to play Finale of Devastation, you you should play an N Ray's Forerunner. Okay, I buy it. Um, yeah, this I think this deck is 
could be where I end up wanting to be. Um, it's it's got a lot of stuff that I want to do. I think Uro Titan of Nature's Wrath is awesome. I think Thassa Deep Dwelling combined with four Cavalier of Thorns in a deck that has any number of Uro Titan of Nature's Grass Wrath greater than zero is. I mean, it's just. I mean, you're just gonna get there. I, I, and the fact that you, the fact that you're setting up to get there, I, and it, what is the opponent going to do? Your guys are all great at blocking. Don't you want to play four Fable Passage in this deck? Maybe I'm just so greedy with the Uro, but man, I want to do it, do it. Um, you could, yeah. I, uh, I I could buy that. Uh, what do you think about Castle Garenbrig in this deck? Like the sex doesn't get a huge oh, yeah. amount from Castle Garenbrig. Yeah, it does, dude. You have end raise forerunners and hydroid crasses. Yeah, but you have like three hydroid crasses. I guess we discussed that there's going to be. Four yeah, crasses. we play four, but also uh, this card's good anyway because you don't. When you get the six, you don't actually need all six to be in the same card. You can still split it up. You could have five of it go to Cavalier of Thorns and one of it go to Arboreal Grazer or whatever. I like the Castle Garenbrig. If anything, I would play more. I think you. I. I. Just, I don't like two Castle Vantress in this deck. Oh no, I'm. I'm down for Castle Vantress in this deck. I love. Okay, it. I, I was just gonna play one. Make room for another Fable Passage. What do you think? There's a. To me, there's a card that's missing here. Um. Uh. Well, first of all, what do you think about two shifting Ceratops versus a greater number of shifting Ceratops? I don't want to play too much of that right now. Yeah. There's so many other good options. Because uh, I also, I really do like Wicked Wolf and Love Struck Beast. You think that's enough defense? Like there's No, there's... not necessarily. I don't understand. I don't know why we have a second Thassa in the sideboard. I, maybe there's a reason, but I don't know what it is. Do you, I mean, what about just naturally drawing Thassa? I guess. Against whom? People who, people who will be messed up if you have like a relatively fast Risen Reef. I mean, this deck. I guess, but I, but I actually it, want it, to play Quasi Duplicate in this deck. I mean, you can. You can't play that much of that. I I do like Thoughts better than Quasi Duplicate. I would just like, play. Qua- well, I guess Thoughts is like is Tha- Qua- uh, Quasi Duplicate for nothing, right? It, right, among other things. It it's actually better on Curve, I think, most of the time. Yeah, I think if you're going to play Quasi Duplicate, it's got to be well. Maybe it's just so good that you do it anyway. But I think it works. Even better if you have more uh, self mill in some ways, so that you're. It. So if you like were if you had a build that was like leaning even harder into the Uro Titan and Nature's Wrath direction with self mill, maybe uh, Quasi Duplicate becomes good there. But I sure do think Thassa Deep Dweller is a better card than Quasi Duplicate on the average. I agree with that statement. Um, so the, what I, I I don't think that there's enough defense in this deck though. Yeah, like, this deck is great if you're playing against blue white, right? It's, I think it's way less great when you're playing against black red beatdown or like, or uh, you know knights or something like that. I, I think that I would want Gadwick in this deck. You were talking earlier about once you're in green uh-huh. white, I want Gadwick. Like Howard, no, nah, dude, you got finale of devastation and raise forerunner, the Thassa Cavalier of Thorns engine, dude, the Hydroid Crassus. You're not gonna have a problem that way. Besides, dude, I think the only reason you were like crutching on Gatwick in this deck is because you weren't playing N Race Forerunners. You'll see. Try playing one copy of N Race Forerunners. Let's finish the game, huh? Yeah, dude. Gatwick, like it you, you'll see. I I love Gatwick. You know I love Gatwick. Dude, I don't you're think the one who got me on Gatwick. I'm telling you, I love Gatwick. I don't think this deck needs Gatwick. I my criticism of this deck is your opponent plays like a first turn Javier Dominguez. You you're shuffling up for game two, and you can't like your your options in game two, right? Like I, Love Struck I would, Beast is not going to be good enough. I mean, it's just, it's it's like what it's the best thing you have. Yeah, well, it's not enough. that's part of the pro- that's part of the problem with blue green is the, there's a real lack of anything against uh, that sort of stuff. I mean, ember cleaves and all of that. I mean, really, ember cleaves. Okay. What does this deck do if they have a dinosaur with an ember cleave, right? Do they have any defense to that? Zero Block, defensive uh, ability, right? Block. Dinosaurs 14, 15, 16 power. Yep. And then it tramples. Yeah. You're, yep. you're, what, block with all of the creatures in your deck? 
<laughs> no, just try to jump by with one more turn. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. And Six, then go off. powers a lot. Like, then you got to go off next turn. Yeah, so. I I don't know. I don't think you're beating Ember Cleave. Uh, I still, I, I think this deck is hip. Um, can you imagine if they didn't ban Oko and uh, Once Upon a Time? Just throwing it out there. These cards were all yeah. in, in development at the same time. So uh, it's it's still going to be hip. Yep. Awesome, dude. What's your favorite deck of the week? Mono Black Devotion. Me too. It is too clean. It does not have any obvious holes. Like blue green is powerful looking. Seriously obvious holes. Mono Black doesn't have any obvious holes. And its end game is less flashy and will kill you just as good. Which also, I think the Black Devotion is going to... There's enough good stuff here that it's going to transcend to uh, Pioneer as well. I agree. Absolutely. All right. Awesome, dude. See you next week. Sin life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, it's a jailer hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber 